This is the FISA update session of the combined World Rowing Coaches Conference and National Federations Conference. We have in the room the key stakeholders of our sport. So we, uh, this is the experiment to bring together the Joint Commission's meeting, the National Federation's conference, and the Coaches Conference on one place at one time. So we're looking forward to your feedback on how this works out for everyone. So uh, Jean-Christophe and I will be presenting a few topics. I will start off. And we have a couple slides to review the We have a couple slides to review the 2017 season. Okay, so we're pleased to uh, review a couple key performance indicators for you. Uh, for Sarasota Bradenton, the 2017 World Rowing Championships, it was the second most successful uh, championships ever broadcasted for us and coming in the year after the Olympic Games, where we usually have a drop-off, um, we're very pleased with that result. So um, at the end of the year, you'll get more uh, statistics like this, but this is the first one. Do we need a new battery or is it, okay. All right, um, one, uh, another of our goals, we call it our total digital impact. And you know we changed our strategy uh, in 2011 to emphasize digital communications. And we project uh, by the end of the year to have reached over 80 million uh, impressions on our uh, various digital platforms. So you can see uh, since we started in 2011 with this as a strategic objective, uh, it's going fairly well. So we're very pleased about that. Um, and it, we hope it reflects the users of our and the people seeking information and content from us that uh, it seems to work. Next slide, please. Okay, we had a, uh, I'll just make, take a moment to say how pleased we were with the World Championships in Sarasota Bradenton. As you know, we had a little blip uh, with two weeks to go called Irma. Uh, which was uh, forecast to go right on top of the regatta venue. But luckily it took a right turn and went past and we had an extremely successful event. A couple images and a couple KP performance indicators for you. Um, total economic impact, direct and indirect, is estimated at over 22 million dollars. and. Next slide, please. Um, hotel nights, over 25,000. Next slide. <coughs> Visitors from out of country, over 6,000. Okay. So several thank yous. Go ahead, click on through. We have a lot of uh, partners who helped make that a success. Go ahead. A friend who joined us over there, and next, and three particularly hard-working, capable people who helped make it happen, Mr. Benderson of the development company, Meredith, the director, and the man who had the dream, Paul Blackheader uh, of Sarasota. So, a uh, very successful event. Okay, we'll take a minute uh, to welcome Mike Sweeney to the room. Welcome, Mike Sweeney. <laughs> I have to take every chance I get. <laughs> so the season is now uh, in front of us in uh, four months time, five months time. And that's a little look on one slide of uh, what we have to look forward to. This year, we are sorting out the location of the Coastal Championships uh, very soon. Um, we have uh, now received some bids, so we'll get that sorted out very soon. Um, 
test event for the 2019, the Olympic Qualification World Championships, will be the second World Cup in Linz Ottentheim. And we're really pleased that the infrastructure project has been completed on time, it was last month. So it's a, a very different looking venue um, with a to totally new sport infrastructure and boathouse area. And then we'll be in Plovdiv, Bulgaria, on the fastest, uh, the, one of the fastest rowing courses in the world. And finally, to get the senior athletes there uh, in September will be a fantastic event. Ending the season with the Youth Olympic Games in Buenos Aires, rowing continues to be a part of this, um, let's say, pathway event for the Olympic movement. And we'll be right in the center of things on Puerto Madero in this uh, renovated port area with um, the, the Lead Hotel nearby and some of the best steaks, best steak restaurants in, in the world uh, alongside the course. Not that that matters. Next slide, please. Okay, and uh, I'm really pleased to announce that uh, for the first time um, we've, uh, in our, with our partners U.S. Rowing, Concept2, and the Alexandria Organizing Committee, uh, we will have in February the first World Rowing Indoor Championships. So following the success of uh, indoor rowing featuring in the World Games this year, this last August, and uh, the progress made with Concept2, um, We've uh, agreed this. Now I can see the slides before I have to speak to them. Um, and this will be announced next week, but I wanted you to know, um, as part of the development of the performance pyramid for indoor rowing, um, and we're really pleased to, to make this step forward. Um, so thanks to Concept2, U.S. Rowing, and uh, amazing venue in Alexandria, Virginia, which is just across the river from Washington, D.C. This event will take place, and world rowing championships will be attributed. Next please. So we'll now move to upcoming Olympic Games and Paralympic Games. Um, first is to say that we will be launching uh, next week our new strategic event attribution process. What does that mean? We, we know that significant investments are being made by our friends and the government authorities to our venues all around the world. Um, and they're asking us for a more strategic approach to get to calculate the return on investment, to, to tell their investors and, and taxpayers that we have a strategy for the return on our investment for these venues. And we would rather have a strategic approach than a kind of uh, haphazard bid process um, that uh, we've had in the past. So um, we'll have a, it's basically a two-year process um, where we will consult with, with you, the National Federation leaders, with the organizing committee leaders, and with your government authorities to hear your goals, to hear the, you know, objectives uh, on uh, the use of the venues so that we can work with them to understand what they need because we need them to stage our events and we need these venues to have, if possible, a positive return or break even uh, in, in use. So uh, we'll have a consultation period, confidential <laughs> consultation period to hear their goals and objectives, to try to place uh, their wishes onto our chart. Um, if we see that we have some going for this event and no one for this event. We will make suggestions about how to fill in our chart. Um, and that will lead to hopefully completing our chart by the Congress of 2019 and having a clear picture for our sport going forward, but also giving an opportunity to our key stakeholders, the government authorities and the venues to best utilize uh, the infrastructures that we have. So um, World Rowing is, uh, this is an innovation from us um, to, to make this happen and uh, we're, we're proud of it and we, we hope and we think it will work. So National Federation leaders and organizers, please, this will be coming out next week and we want to start to meet you, to meet your government authorities and to start discussing uh, how we can best use the venues. 
Another update is that uh, we have joined with uh, UNESCO and WWF to work on uh, protecting the World Heritage Sites. Um, there are 206 sites in 96 countries. Um, we will make uh, an announcement about this, but they have asked us to be their partner to uh, protect and preserve these World Heritage Sites um, if events are taking place. So some sporting events um, that are near or using World Heritage Sites, we're going <coughs> to take a position with WWF and UNESCO to respect all of the wishes they have um, for the universal value of these sites. So you'll hear more about this later, but um, Trakai, for example, the castle uh, across from the Finnish tower in Trakai is one of the sites, and, um, but we're at, uh, undergoing an audit of our events. Um, you as a national federation can check uh, this website. You will get this uh, an email from us and try to figure out if you have rowing venues near World Heritage Sites and what you can do to contribute. Colleen, our s sport director and sustainability director is the contact for this. Okay, now we do go really now to the Olympic and Paralympic updates. We'll start with Tokyo, which is straight ahead of us, less than three years. The big <laughs> Sorry. Uh, change, please. You don't know what I was talking about because the slide didn't change. <laughs> All right. Um, let's go back one. So what I was looking at here and you weren't seeing is that uh, we're going to work with you and your government authorities to try to fill in this chart. I was wondering why some of the faces were a little blank. Um, and try to make a win-win for the stakeholders of our venues and for our sport to have venues happening, to have our events happening in a strategic way which benefits the venues. Okay, here are the slides that I was seeing and you weren't on the World Heritage site, so I won't repeat them except that please, uh, you will hear more about this from us and there's a chance for you to get involved um, if you know about a World Heritage site that is near a rowing venue, you can contact Colleen and hear more. Okay. Now we really do come to uh, update about Olympic and Paralympics. So we'll start with Tokyo. Um, a couple updates about Sea Forest, our Sea Forest venue in Tokyo. Um, so we're pleased, we'll talk about the test event, which has been recently confirmed thanks to the Japanese Rowing Association. Um, a possible schedule conflict, which we wanted to uh, make you aware of. Um, and then an update on where we are with the qualification systems for the Olympics and the Paralympics. Just to refresh your memory, uh, Sea Forest is in a reclaimed land area in Tokyo Bay, very near the Olympic Village. Um, you'll see it in a minute. Does this work here? So we are here with the Olympic Village being here. So uh, again, you, oops. you can see the location of the Olympic Village in Tokyo Bay. Here's the famous Rainbow Bridge. And just down here is Sea Forest, uh, our venue for the Olympic and Paralympic regattas. So it's about uh, 15 minutes from the village, right in the center of things. That's the good news. Um, we will have rowing and canoeing there, but you should know that this is the venue for uh, equestrian cross country. Um, this is a one-day event, and part of our um, part of our contribution to reducing the budget of the Olympic venue and the Olympic Games was to uh, share facilities with the equestrian cross-country event. So, uh, ingress for spectators for our venue and for the equestrian venue will be the same facilities. So the same buses coming from the metro stop uh, with spectators accessing this area uh, will be used as well as some back of house 
uh, facilities, the security screening, the staging area for the spectators. So uh, we just learned from the Equestrian Federation that the horses cannot compete after 11.30 a.m. It becomes too hot and humid for the horses. Um, I said, what about Lawrence of Arabia and the Wild West? And oh, no, those are different horses. Those are Arabic horses, not these Northern European cold horses. So, and uh, they gave us a very interesting uh, um, screening of the, basically they take better care of their horses than we take care of our athletes. So uh, sun, exposure to the sun, humidity, heat, uh, etc. So. Um, the bottom line is um, we don't want to compete uh, outside of the morning for, for wind conditions, for weather conditions, and the horses must also compete in the morning. So we're looking at some scenarios of how uh, we can create a gap, um, and uh, it might be that we would start the rowing competition on the Friday, on the opening ceremony day, because we don't want to give up our spare day, um, we think it's important we keep a spare day after Rio, losing two days. Um, we, it, we don't know what could happen, so uh, you'll hear more about this. We're studying it deeper, we're trying to find out more about the horses. But uh, yeah, one of the scenarios we're looking at is starting rowing on the Friday, the opening ceremony morning. So those who compete on the Friday could go to the opening ceremony that night because you won't have a rep the next day, which would be a change. Um, so we wanted to make you aware of that issue. The construction is on time um, for the venue. This was the report uh, made by Daisuke at the <coughs> Congress, um, and it will be on time for uh, the World Junior Championships, which um, one of the cost reductions for uh, the overall Olympic project was to step back uh, on the cost of uh, test events, but very, we're really lucky that uh, the Japanese Rowing Association understood how important it is for our sport that we have this um, significant event to test the venue. A totally new venue for us um, that really needed a, a strong uh, test event. So um, that was locked down um, in September and um, is moving forward. So the World Junior Championships in 2019 will take place at the Sea Forest venue. Okay. Uh, an update on the Olympic qualification system. So it was recently sent uh, following the Congress. We had a couple good questions and comments at the uh, Congress in Sarasota. Um, and those questions have been answered. Um, and I'll just, and uh, we sent out the nearly final draft to you the other day to, to, to get any final comments, but I'll review a little bit on that. Um, again, uh, the process was um, a, a elaborate uh, number of NF meetings and consultation. Um, we went back and set a term, terms of reference. We agreed principles, we got the decision on the quota, and then we um, tried to address the principles through um, the different uh, objectives that we established. The quota, or let's say, the ratio between excellence and participation, the distribution of quota between um, the final events and the continents, so the World Championships and Final Qualification Regatta and the continents, um, the, the principle of at least two chances to qualify, um, and then we establish these limits on participation in the continental qualification regattas. And this uh, will go to the IOC for a decision in February by the executive board, um, one of whom is sitting in this room in front of me, Mr. Dennis Oswald, um, so he won't make problems for us uh, when this comes up okay. Um, if you can find this on the website or we'll, uh, we can send it to you if you haven't had access to it. Um, this is the total approach, oops. So World Championships, Asia, Oceania, Africa, Americas and European, qualification regattas, the four boat classes, 
um, the host nation and then the tripartite and then final qualification regatta. Um, and what uh, the, the, the latest um, change, and I'll just mention it, a series of things. So uh, what are the significant changes? Um, gender equal program, as you all know, um, lightweight men's four is out, and women's four is in. We had an overall reduction in quota from 550 to 526, when many other sports suffered even uh, bigger reductions. Um, the impact on the individual boat classes for the men's four will go from 13 to 10, the women's pair from 15 to 13, and the lightweight doubles each from 20 to 18. Um, more qualification places for the women's squad from 7 to 10, and the women's four, which will be back for the first time in uh, many years, to be 10. There will be at least two chances to qualify, um, and in some cases, three. So uh, the final qualification regatta has qualification spots also for anyone in the two singles and the two lightweight doubles. Okay, we put in for the first time the limitation that if you qualify at two boats or more at the World Championships, did I get this right? Yes. You may not go to your continental qualification regatta. If you qualify two or more boats at the World Championships 2019, you are no longer eligible to seek the participation places at the continental qualification regattas. And remember, those are the two singles and the two lightweight doubles. We have places attributed to the continental qualification regattas. But everyone can go to the final qualification regatta, which will offer all 14 events. Um, and you may not, if you've qualified one at the World Championships, you can't qualify two or more at the Continental Qualification Regattas. You may, you may come out of the Continental Qualification Regatta with a maximum of two uh, qualification places. Um, we will separate uh, the European Continental Qualification Regatta from the final continent, final qualification regatta, um, and we'll place it probably on the second, just before the second World Cup in the four boat classes for the Europeans who did not qualify two or more at the World Championships. Uh, and then the final qualification regatta will be just before Lucerne, which is a World Cup three in 2020. Did I confuse everyone? <coughs> Okay, you can see this on paper, um, no problem, let us know. Following uh, the uh, IOC decisions on the program, the, they were, the IPC was delivered the number of uh, athletes they may have at the Paralympic Games, and uh, we are now in the process. We have been uh, attributed our quota for the Paralympic Games. So there will be 4,350 athletes and 528 medal events. Um, and of course, the National Federation, or International Federations requested uh, uh, a lot more events and a lot more medals. At the end of the day, we continue with our program of four boat classes, 96 athletes, 48 men, 48 women. Um, so we have uh, started into the Paralympic qualification system. It will be discussed more tomorrow morning uh, at the para rowing conference in more detail. But we've taken a similar approach to step back, uh, assess the principles that we want to achieve for the sport uh, through the qualification system. Um, a key performance indicator for the IPC is the number of NPCs, National Paralympic Committees, participating. Again, for uh, Beijing and London, 23, and in Rio, 25. Um, we will now, for this cycle, introduce continental qualification for the Paralympic Games. 
so we will offer uh, some boats to the continental qualification, but only for countries that did not qualify through the world championships. So only open to new countries that did not qualify already for the Paralympic Games. Um, we believe that this will be a stimulation to develop para rowing. The latest draft of this qualification system looks like this and we will of course give you more detail tomorrow for, or are available to give you more detail um, if you are interested. Um, but this is what uh, the qualification looks like. Uh, only the singles will have continental qualification places in this our first step into the continents for uh, Paralympic qualification. What has changed, it's highlighted here, um, the number of singles, um, attributing the four to the continents in each of the two genders. And then only one boat can qualify per NPC, per nation, at the continental qualification regattas. Next steps. Um, we will distribute this and ask you to uh, give us any feedback and uh, ideas by the 22nd of December. We have to submit it to the IPC. Of course, we've been working with them on it. Um, and the IPC will publish in uh, January, February for all uh, stakeholders in the Paralympic movement. Um, and we will be working closely with the Continental Federations, Confederations, uh, about preparing the Continental Qualification Regattas. Next, Paris, just to give you an orientation, Jean-Christophe should be doing this. Um, you know that the, the Olympic Village, you don't know, you might not know, Olympic Village of Paris is in the, a bit north of uh, downtown, the center, and rowing is out here at um, Bersumann uh, Regatta Venue. <coughs> this is um, a picture of this venue, which we haven't been to since 1997 for a world rowing event. Jean-Christophe put in about 500,000 kilometers up and back on this venue, but um, it's been totally renovated. Uh, whoops. It's been totally renovated in the finish area, and it's a huge new training center uh, for French rowing, for local rowing, uh, with a huge infrastructure, as well as the white water canoe venue uh, up above and behind the boathouse. So we have our venue, we don't have big issues, it's done, it's finished, constructed, and we can just look forward to a great regatta in Paris. Los Angeles, as you know, the Olympic Games for 2028 were attributed in, uh, in, in September in Lima, and uh, Los Angeles will be the host. The uh, venue uh, uh, submitted with the bid that meets all of our requirements is Lake Paris, which is out here near Riverside. Um, and it's uh, more than two hours from the Olympic Village. Uh, so that means there, will be a, there would be a sub-Olympic Village uh, at the University of California, Riverside. Who was in 1984 in UC Santa Barbara? in the room, so uh, a sub, uh, a University of California uh, village, uh, if we use that venue. So here's showing the location of University of California Riverside in a 15 minute travel to Lake Paris. It looks like this, it's a reservoir with a dam and it conforms with all of our uh, 10 lane standards um, for rowing venue. Um, we are, as we have 11 years to go until that Olympic Games, we are continuing to investigate all, all kinds of options for uh, the Olympic regatta, but this one is sure water is there, land is there, uh, and we have a, a good solution. 
Okay, next uh, we'll go into some government governance issues. First, anti-doping, which has the media attention day in and day out. Um, we'll start with um, Russia and the recent decision of the IOC, and we're really luck fortunate to have uh, the chair of the Oswald Commission, which uh, has been very active. I don't think he slept for about the last month, but we'd like to ask Dennis Oswald to take, it, take the opportunity of asking Dennis Oswald, uh, IOC executive board member, our honorary president, to give us a little explanation about uh, the situation with Russia and particularly the McLaren report and the upcoming Winter Olympic Games. Well, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be within the rowing family again after uh, several months dedicated to far less pleasant activity. I will try to be brief so that you can dedicate your time to something more rowing than uh, what I, uh, I'm going to, to explain to you. I don't know how much uh, informed you are about what's happening, what has been happening, uh, but uh, I will try to summarize and, and uh, what, uh, what the situation uh, is at the moment. If we go a little bit back uh, you will probably remember that last year, before the Olympic Games in Rio, uh, Professor McLaren produced a report confirming the assumption that there has been a cheating system about uh, doping, a manipulation of uh, doping tests in, in Russia. Uh, the principle was that uh, during summer, the Russian authority have collected clean samples from the athletes who were supposed to compete a few months later at the Olympic Games in Sochi. And in Sochi, they put in place a system where they would substitute uh, the urine collected after the competition from their own athlete and replace it with the clean urine which had been collected a few months before. Uh, it was not, of course, not discovered at the moment, but uh, was uh, discovered later when the director of the laboratory, Sochi and Moscow laboratory, uh, Dr. Grigory Rochenkov, uh, Russia, and was allowed to speak and uh, reveal what has been uh, done in, uh, in Russia. The IOC then appointed two commissions to understand better what has been happening. One is so-called Schmidt Commission, which uh, was supposed to investigate the involvement of the sporting and political authority of Russia in this uh, scheme. And the other one was the commission I've been chairing, and our duty was to determine whether uh, athletes were personally implicated and had committed uh, anti-doping violation which would justify that they are sanctioned. Uh, the, the situation we had is uh, totally different from the usual situation we have in doping cases. In doping cases you will re receive a report from a laboratory telling you that uh, a certain substance was found in the urine of an athlete. In that case, uh, all, uh, all analysis return negative result, of course, because of the dirty urine had been substituted with clean urine. And we had to find other ways to establish the doping violation. Different investigations were made by experts to determine whether there had been tampering of the samples. One was a forensic uh, investigation uh, which uh, 
who determined that uh, actually the bottles which are supposed or reputed not uh, possible to open had been opened for the exchange of urine and uh, the expert which, who was appointed for that task uh, came to the conclusion, yes, uh, it, it's possible and you do it, when you do it, you leave some marks which uh, indicate that uh, the, the bottles have been, uh, have been opened. And uh, uh, there were also different other uh, analyses, like the DNA analysis of the different athletes. There was also a question of the salt content of the urine because they uh, had to adjust the level of salt to, to have the same specific gravity of the urine uh, when it was collected or just after it was collected and the urine that they had collected months before to make the substitution. So all this took time, but when we had the first result, we set hearings to hear the different athletes concerned, uh, at least the first one uh, we, who came out from this uh, different analysis. And uh, uh, we started on the 30th of uh, October, and we have continued with uh, quite a number of athletes. At the moment, we have uh, uh, handled 32 cases. We'll have 11 more cases next week, and uh, some more in the future, because the investigation of the forensic expert is not finished, is still, uh, the, the, all bottles of Russian athletes have been examined, or will be examined, and it's a total of 232 bottles, uh, plus the control bottles, about uh, 50 bottles, which will be mixed, or have been mixed, with uh, the Russian bottles, uh, which means that, uh, if, if you consider that it takes between three and six hours per bottle to examine whether they have marks and scratches which indicate tampering, uh, you, you can imagine how much time it takes. So the athletes we have heard uh, uh, have, been, uh, have been sanctioned, with exception of two, where we considered there were not enough elements to sanction them. Uh, and this shows that uh, what we have been doing is not a collective punishment to athletes just because they are Russians, but uh, because uh, we had elements and those where we had no, not enough or no elements, uh, then uh, these ones have, been, uh, not, have not been sanctioned. And uh, we will continue until we have done all the cases, uh, and this will take us until probably uh, middle of January, which will be short before the opening of the uh, Pyeongchang Games. But uh, we have been going as fast as possible, but uh, we are expecting the result of the different uh, experts' uh, study, which are ongoing. In parallel, the Schmidt Commission has also investigated to find out who was involved in this uh, scheme and uh, they delivered their report uh, last uh, uh, Tuesday and they came to the conclusion that yes, there was a scheme in place and uh, that the Russian authorities were behind it. Political authority uh, and partly uh, sport authority. And the IOC, as you probably read in the newspaper, have taken different sanctions, the main one being that Russia will be suspended and will not be allowed to participate in the Olympic Games in Pyeongchang. In order not to punish innocent athletes, the IOC decided that the athletes who can prove that uh, 
they are not they were not involved in this uh, scheme uh, prove that uh, they are clean athletes will be screened by a special committee and possibly be authorized to participate uh, in the games but and the Olympic flag with Olympic anthem and uh, Olympic dress and, and nothing related to, to, to Russia. Uh, at the same time, the executive board followed the recommendation of this uh, Schmidt Commission uh, and especially banned for life the former or the person who was president, who was minister of sport, sorry, Minister of Sport uh, of Russia in, uh, in 2014, and who is now the uh, Deputy Prime Minister of Russia, Mr. Mutko. He is also at the same time the President of the Organizing Committee of the Football World Cup next year. But for the Olympics, he is banned for life, and uh, we won't see him again uh, in the Olympic uh, activities. Another person has been banned for life. It's uh, Dmitry Chernichenko, who was the president of the, the, the director of the organiz organizing committee of the Sochi Games, and who is now the director of the KHL, which is the equivalent of the NHL in ice hockey for the eastern part of Europe. Uh, Okay, in a nutshell and very briefly, it's uh, what we have been doing within the Commission and within the Executive Board of the IOC. Thank you, Dennis. We're proud and confident that having you in the driver's seat uh, for these careful, important decisions is uh, to help us. We wanted to also review with you uh, the steps that FISA has taken uh, and remind you that uh, two weeks before Rio, uh, the FISA Executive Committee had was required by the IOC Executive Board to, dis to make uh, recommendations on eligibility for Rio, and as you recall, um, we reviewed the anti-doping background of every uh, Russian athlete entered for the Rio Olympic Games and only qualified uh, five or six athletes uh, out of the total delegation. Um, and they had one boat in Rio. Um, we had to address what for 2017 could we do to try to reestablish uh, about a level playing field, uh, uh, similar conditions for all athletes. Um, RUSADA, the anti-doping agency for Russia, had been suspended um, and was non-compliant from middle of 2015, so the number of tests taking place in Russia w had fallen way behind. WADA put in uh, UK anti-doping uh, to try to raise the number of tests in Russia, but um, there was a, 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 a significant imbalance in testing between all the other athletes in the world and Russians. So, uh, as you've probably read and know, FISA took steps to try to reestablish as much as we could a more level playing field in terms of testing. The Russians were required to uh, submit uh, any names of athletes for any uh, world run event by uh, March 1st of 2017, so we knew exactly which athletes uh, to focus our attention on. Um, the Russians were asked to contribute 50,000 euros to an enhanced testing program, uh, and they did. We received all of this money. Um, that led to us and WADA intensifying testing during 2017, leading up to um, Sarasota. Um, and. Uh, 414 tests were carried out on these uh, specified Russian rowers um, leading up to Sarasota. Going forward, what's next? Rusada continues to be non-compliant. Um, and that means the testing will have to be conducted outside of Russia. Um, and this is something that uh, we are 
uh, going to be discussing and paying attention to what can we do for rowing. Um, and uh, you'll hear more about that in a minute. Uh, sorry, <laughs> coming up. Um, and just to say, um, <coughs> you may have read that in the Ma second McLaren report, which came out uh, in December 2016, uh, 1,000 uh, athletes um, allegedly uh, benefited or participated in the system systematic uh, manipulation of doping controls in Russia. Ten of those were identified as rowers. Um, where we are is uh, we've been waiting for the Schmidt and Oswald Commission and the IOC um, commissions to finish their work to see the reasons, decisions, and background uh, and actions that they would take. Um, we've uh, been told that uh, a new hard disk, a new, the database of the Moscow lab has been handed over by a whistleblower um, and next Thursday uh, WADA will explain to us exactly what is on this hard disk and this database. Possibly we will see the result of the original analysis being registered then that caused the message to go to the Deputy Minister of Sport with the command to save, in other words, change from positive to negative, and we might have uh, valid evidence other than exchange of email messages um, to, to move forward. So you'll hear more about that as well, um, but uh, we want to have a total solid legal basis for any actions we take uh, on the basis of the McLaren uh, reports and investigations. Um, you may have read, and I won't take too much of your time, we're spending a, a, a large num amount of time on this, um, WADA and the IOC have announced the creation of an independent testing authority to remove from the national uh, anti-doping agencies and the international federations any uh, potential conflicts, perceived conflicts of interest in testing and will establish this authority um, with the close involvement of Dr. Richard Budget, our rowing gold medalist and IOC medical director. Hello, okay, thank you. Um, it, will, it is a foundation, um, and as I said, it will try to, it will be a way to give the international federations and anti-doping authorities an independent body to carry out the testing, to uh, conduct the reviews and hearings and establish punishments separated from any national interests or sporting interests. Um, and this is one of the key issues affecting all of us um, in the sporting movement and Olympic movement. This is the staging of the development of this uh, ITA. It's not Italy, ITA, Intermediate Testing Authority, um, and it will be up and running very soon um, for the uh, 2018 Winter Olympic Games. Um, at the Congress, uh, and leading up to the Congress, we announced steps that we were taking on our own uh, incentive to um, make, continue to make improvements and create more independence in our own anti-doping uh, process. You can read this on the website, I won't take time, but you can see that we aren't asleep and that we are reacting and trying to be on the leading edge of uh, the trends and issues in the field of anti-doping. Okay, now we'll ask Jean-Christophe Roland, President of FISA, to come to the stage. You have to click and look at the computer. Okay. So I have to click and to look. Yes. Thank you, Matt. Good afternoon to everyone. I hope you have still some energy and uh, you're not too tired. Uh, we are starting the last session of the day. Uh, and uh, thank you to Matt and all this, uh, I would say, quite technical update on what is going on in our organization, in our sport. I will move now to uh, the I would say the more political aspect and the strategy and, and the future within the context. But before that, just let me say uh, just 
two words about the previous con the previous uh, uh, subject about anti-doping and uh, just to say again but you know and I'm sure you will agree uh, we can be proud in FISA to what we have been doing for the uh, all the years against doping we can be proud of, of our um, yeah, fight against against uh, doping we have really in our DNA uh, from the athletes to all our uh, people involved in our sport and that's uh, that's sometimes very important to uh, to say and I can tell you that FISA is considered outside of uh, I mean in the world of sport and outside of our community as a as a, as a leader in that in that uh, dimension so I would like also to take the opportunity to thank very much uh, uh, the, the, the people who are in charge of, of uh, this dimension, I can tell you that they are working uh, like hell uh, behind the scene. I'm talking about uh, the uh, coordinator of the anti-doping uh, department, Alain Lacoste, and, and uh, Nathalie Schmutz, who is he, uh, dealing with all these administrative uh, tasks. I can tell you that it's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of work and they are, they are doing it uh, uh, very professionally. That makes, uh, again, our organization, our sport, uh, 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 on a very good uh, position within that, uh, uh, in, in that dimension. Unfortunately, I mean, as you know, the, in the, the world of sport is really experiencing very big and tough uh, challenges. The, the, uh, doping is, is one of them. And because of uh, globalization, because of in the media, you know, uh, all the sports, uh, all the athletes are doped, all the leaders are corrupted, there is a kind of globalization. And uh, obviously, there are, we are not at the same level in, in all the sports, and it's difficult to have uh, one, on one single voice in the, in the world of sports. So you may see in, in the media, uh, that uh, obviously the sports organization don't want to fight against doping because it will damage their image. So it's difficult to hear. But uh, uh, again, uh, the situation between the sports, between the federations, between the organization, it's certainly not uh, the same. So that said, again, uh, we can be proud. We'll continue to fight because this is a battle that is not over. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, and it will be uh, it will continue uh, in the in the future, uh, but uh, again, uh, FISA we can be proud on 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 our approach in that um, in that fight. Let's move now to uh, another topic. Uh, uh, I would say very important, and and uh, I am conscious that in the room, uh, I would say the level of. Uh, of knowledge on, the, on all what I'm going to say, it's certainly different. So, uh, some of you, maybe f most of you, will have heard this uh, uh, this uh, message already. But it's important to to really to share, and this is our approach uh, actually in FISA uh, with the council and the executive committee uh, to really engage you, uh, all the stakeholders in our community. Uh, in what is very important for the future of our sport. So, if we move, uh, uh, if we go back a few months, uh, you remember uh, it was at the, at the National Federation Conference here in, in London in May, in May, no, in March 2015, we started that uh, the so-called uh, driving uh, uh, rowing future, uh, rowing future, uh, to uh, to anticipate and to prepare the necessary changes we have uh, to uh, uh, decide within our sport. And if you remember, I will we have this uh, three-year-long uh, uh, process to, uh, to work on uh, the, key and the key decision that would have impact our sport. Why? Because simply because the world of sport is really changing and very fast and we cannot we cannot if you don't uh, jump in the train if you stay on the track one day or another uh, uh, you will die so we have to adapt to this fast uh, moving environment and for us what does that mean it means to understand the challenges and of the world of sport and mainly because we all will agree if I say that being an Olympic sport is just 
uh, for rowing vital for you, the federations, for, for, for our sport, for our athletes, to be part of the Olympic program, to be part, to be a sport in the Olymp Olympic movement, it's essential, it's vital. And as I said at the time, uh, can we consider that we are in danger? Danger? Probably not, because of our past, because of our, uh, 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 because of our sport. But we are certainly at risk. And I will come back uh, just later on, on what are the key challenges uh, of the IOC. We have to understand the big picture. We have to understand what is going on outside of our sport to make the necessary changes in our sport. So that's why we have launched this process. And as you can see on the screen, three years later, we have been in a position to, to take any opportunity to engage you, uh, coaches, the technical uh, um, uh, stakeholders, the political stakeholders, the federations, through uh, all these uh, 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 meetings to build with you the right uh, um, solutions so that we could ensure uh, the best sustainable future for our sport. So this process was built to uh, lead to the external congress in Tokyo uh, uh, this year, and also uh, um, and after the key decision, and, uh, and you know about the key decision was to uh, uh, understand the IOC challenges, and we've moved actually to a, uh, to a proposal to a, for a, a gender equal program at the Olympic Games. Based on this key decision, actually right after the Excellent Congress in Tokyo, we launched the four uh, review projects you have on the screen. Because obviously this decision had an impact on, on, our, uh, on our sport. So Rule 36, as you know, is about the World Rowing Championships, our own program. Obviously, there is a, a direct link between the Olympic program and the, and the world rowing the world rowing program. So the idea was to uh, review our program based on the uh, decision of the Olympic program. So this this project have been, has been uh, uh, launched right after the the, uh, the Exonic Congress and has led to the decision in Sarasota at the last ordina ordinary congress to a new to a new world rowing uh, program in the different uh, in the different uh, categories in the different age group and uh, as you know this program was adopted at, in Sarasota um, uh, um, um, right after the world championships so we have now uh, a new Rule 36, a new program that will uh, go on from uh, next year. Matt has presented you the Olympic qualification system. Uh, again, I would like, I will not go into detail, it has been presented and you can understand uh, uh, the, the outcome and we will be presenting this uh, uh, quite final project to the IOC very soon. Let me just say that this working group has made a tremendous work. This process we have launched right after the uh, um, Tokyo de uh, decision to lead to the proposal that has been submitted or will be submitted to the ASA. I would just like uh, to pay tribute and to thank all the contributors. This exercise was for sure far from easy. Uh, but you have, been, you have been involved, and if you look at the final result, it was really made of, obviously, of the experience of the past. We've learned from the previous Olympic qualification systems. We tried not to repeat uh, probably some unexpected uh, um, situations, but also we have, I, I believe, we have found a, a system that will reinforce or make our, uh, um, make our participation at the Games even, even better. So, 
Again, it was with a lot of constraints outside. You know, the Olympic, uh, uh, the Olympic athletes quota was a key, uh, a key entry point, but also how to, uh, to weigh between excellence and participation. And at the end, again, at the end, I think uh, the, the outcome is really remarkable based on all these constraints. Uh, another review project concerned the power rowing. Again, a key decision in, in Tokyo was to, ex to move from 1,000 to 2,000, and which led us to uh, a review and to rethink about how to develop further and how to, uh, uh, to build our strategy for, for the future in, in power rowing. So, as you can see, the first phase has been uh, uh, completed. It was about uh, working on the, on the World Championship program. It has been adopted in uh, Sarasota, Bradenton. Uh, and then we have also conducted research to help in, uh, uh, in, in, uh, in the different uh, areas of, uh, of this discipline. We have, we have now moved to the phase two. And uh, as you know, uh, tomorrow there will be a power rowing conference dedicated to look at all these uh, different aspects and to discuss all these different aspects. So again, this is a project, uh, uh, as you know, that we, we have launched for, the ne for, for two years, actually. Uh, um, the first two projects, obviously, were until, until the, the, the Congress, but the, the, the last two and this one is uh, 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 continuing and ongoing. Okay, three, the last project is about lightweight. The decision the Extremely Congress made to remove the lightweight minus four from the Olympic program inevitably had a consequence on this uh, category. And immediately, I mean, during the Extremely Congress, we committed to uh, launch this proce process to work on how can we uh, continue to promote uh, the lightweight in our sport, uh, because we all believe that it, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a category that, was a, that is important for, for, uh, for our sport. So we launched uh, this, uh, this project, and they have worked, and I would like also take the opportunity to, to thank the contributors to work on finding the arguments uh, to, uh, the, the, and, and to uh, promote the, uh, the lightweight uh, category within our sport, and also to think about uh, the pressure from, uh, uh, from the Olympic uh, uh, movement, from the IOC, on the Olympic program. And now, uh, I think I need to move uh, to the context, and, and, and as we mentioned uh, in Tokyo, and then after the decision was made, uh, we committed to continue to work uh, with the IOC on this, uh, on this uh, uh, dimension. As you know, the, the um, Olympic program was actually validated by the executive board on the 9th of June. So this is the good news. This was the good news at the time. Uh, the proposal from FISA that was built in, a, in Tokyo has been approved by the executive board, which is the authority to decide the Olympic program. But we have circulated the letter uh, we've received from the general director of the IOC. The good news was actually twofold. First, your program, your proposal is accepted. The second point in this letter was about the reduction of the athletes' quota from 50, 550 to 526, which I can tell you is a quite a good ach achievement, again, based on the context, but I will come back to the context later on. But there is a sentence at the bottom of the letter that was absolutely clear. They will not give up on the pressure we got before Tokyo. So if you believe that all the exercise we've made through the last three years to reach that position, to reach, uh, if you believe that we have reached a kind of plateau of stability, 
uh, forget it. We are starting a new process uh, with the IOC. And it's not just, don't make it wrong, it's not just about throwing. It's the general approach from the IOC to reconsider um, uh, each cycle, to reconsider the program, to ensure that they have the flexibility to adapt the program to what is the best for the Olympic Games. So it's not, it's not that rowing is targeted uh, and more targeted than the other. But the point is that based on the, on the pressure the, the IOC has, and I will now move to the challenges of the IOC, they have to really to, uh, to move ahead in a sense that also the Olympic Games are the most successful event in the world. And if you look at the figures uh, on Rio 2016, it's just amazing. More than half, more than half of the world have, show, have watched or, uh, and, and followed the Olympic Games. So the success of the Olympic Games is not on que at, at question. The problem is the lack of bid. And the problem is the financial aspect of the Olympic Games. And if you go back to 2013, uh, or to 2014 when the IOC adopted the so-called Olympic Agenda 2020, it was clear that despite the success of the game, it was crucial and vital for the future of the Olympic movement to take the right decision uh, uh, in, in certain aspects of, uh, uh, of the Olympic Games or the Olympic movement. Some and you can, uh, uh, you can remember when we presented these 40 uh, recommendations, uh, some are linked with, uh, directly linked with the Olympic Games. It's about cost, it's about sustainability, and in that respect, uh, um, uh, uh, rowing, like the other uh, IFs or sports, we are really, uh, um, we have to understand and we have to hear the challenges and to address alongside the IOC, all these challenges. They have now moved to a, um, a process called Games Management 2020. I will just give you a little bit of what are the key areas where they are going to to ensure that they can, uh, uh, ens uh, to ensure that they can have a, a, a sustainable future for the Olympic Games. So, this is a challenge. I just mentioned about candidature. Uh, you probably following the uh, the sport news, and one after the other, the candidate the candidate city are just uh, uh, withdrawing. We had for the summer uh, for the last uh, uh, um, 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 campaign, we had uh, three of the five initial bidders have stopped. Uh, their, 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 their bid during the campaign and because of the pressure of the, uh, of, of the public opinion. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a fact that uh, the IOC is really taking into consideration. So the lack, the lack of bidders is, 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 uh, is absolutely essential and the reasons for that mainly one of the reasons it's about complexity to organize the games, it's about the financial, uh, um, uh, the financial aspects also, also uh, behind the financial aspect, uh, there is obviously a mix between uh, the operational uh, budget and the investment budget. But the idea behind is to ensure that the, this sensitiveness of the financial uh, aspect of the games has to be really taken into account. So. Um, this Games Management 2020 is an approach to look at all the different aspects to reduce cost uh, and to ensure uh, 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 flexibility uh, and, and this is uh, the aim of, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the project. So you can see, um, reduce the cost, reduce the complexity, reduce the risk uh, and, and at the same time uh, increase the value of the games. So, again, with this, with this context, uh, um, and you have already heard my message uh, because it's, I'm continuously repeating it, uh, we have 
to work with the IOC to help and contribute to address these challenges. We cannot say, okay, we will decide among rowing and like if we were isolated. And, and in that respect, in terms of cost, uh, it's not only related to the facilities, it's also related to the number of athletes. One of the key, uh, um, I would say, expenses for uh, during the games it's about accommodation for the uh, for the athletes so uh, the pressure is there and we have really to understand uh, to 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 be very close to the ioc and i can tell you that we are in a constant dialogue with the ioc uh, to work on all this aspect as far as our sport is concerned Just to give you a, 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 an order of idea, an idea on, on, on what we are talking about. For the summer games, they are talking about the reduction of one billion for uh, and, 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 and five hundred million for the winter games. So this is a kind of scale uh, of uh, uh, that they are uh, working on. So we, as a, uh, as a sport like the other sport, we have to ensure that we are flexible enough to help in reducing the cost. How to do it? Obviously, uh, to be, uh, that uh, one of the aspects is to be involved uh, with the IOC all along the process of the Olympic Games. It's not about only being uh, on, at the delivery phase, because obviously the sport are responsible to deliver uh, uh, or, or the technical, uh, we have the technical uh, responsibility to deliver the, the, the competition. But it's to be engaged and involved from the very beginning, even during the, 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 the bid phase, so that we can contribute by providing the expertise to reduce the cost. So to come back, this is the, the, the challenges of, of the IOC. We have to understand that. So they, uh, you know, the Olympic Charter defines exactly the size and 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 the the size of the games, and we cannot, they cannot uh, um, uh, go beyond what uh, I mean the, the key aspect of the, the uh, uh, concerning the size. So it's ten thousand and five hundred athletes almost 310 events in that in that perspective with the, the attractiveness for the sports to be part of the games obviously we have as a sport we have the, the pressure and uh, as you, you all know before uh, uh, until Rio we were the third largest sport in terms of athletes quota with 550 now we have moved from the third position to the fourth position so cycling has just uh, moved from one one place and we have moved to the fourth place but still when you look at the at the ranking and the, at the athletes quota it's clear that uh, we will continue to have the uh, to 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 have pressure on us to contribute to the reduction of the of the size of the games so we have to really to to have to bear this in mind how to do that? And I think uh, we have been working for a long time now, but you're all aware about the pressure we have with the IOC on the lightweight uh, category. We have created this, this project. We have saved uh, two events for the Tokyo 2020 Olympic Games. As it is crystal clear in the letter, this does not mean that these two lightweight events are guaranteed for the next edition and as, uh, as uh, already shared with you we have entered already this phase this new phase of discussion with the IOC uh, to prepare the 2024 program at this point in time obviously there is no decision the final decision for the 2024 Olympic Games program in Paris will be made by the executive board the IOC executive board uh, on the uh, in December 2020. December 2020, the final decision. 
Obviously, by then, we will have uh, to, uh, to work on what, uh, how to, to present the FISA's proposals for, the, for this uh, edition of the Games. And again, as I just said, we have entered this discussion already. One thing I would like to express, and it was already expressed uh, um, in, the, uh, in front of the Congress, but I take the opportunity to repeat it. Uh, the pressure on the, on, on, on the lightweight is, is still there, not to say even harder than it was in the past. When we discuss it with the, with the working group uh, or the project review uh, members, it, was, it is clear that the term of reference was to find the best way, the best way to uh, find the best way to give the argument for the IOC or for people outside of our uh, community, of our sport, to justify uh, another category. We have moved to actually to defend the lightweight to uh, a position to how to justify in our sport, which is unique, which is unique, how to justify uh, uh, took, uh, uh, different categories. This is, this is clear and, and we have to move from what we put as an argument in the 1990s. What was absolutely relevant in the, in the late 80s and early 90s when uh, FISA introduced uh, the lightweight in the Olympic Games, these arguments, which were valid with the, with the context, with the then context, this argument will not be received these days. It has to be clear. We, at the time, and it was absolutely excellent for our strategy, in, uh, for the, the future of our sport, it has been an excellent decision. Don't make me wrong. At the time. It's clear now that the IOC will not accept the same argument, argument about universality to develop our sport. This will not be accepted. So we have to find a different way. So it led us to think about how can we approach this uh, challenge. If we limit this exercise to, oh, we have to defend the lightweight, we will be in a position to maybe to find another, another time and, and, and to make in, in a very, I would say, uh, defensive, defensive position that will lead to probably after fight to a, a, a program in 2024 but it's not sustainable. We cannot enter that kind of, of uh, every four years discussion and fight to defend. Uh, uh, we, have, we have to make another step backwards and see the big picture and see the long term. So that's why we decided uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to start with this exercise to build a real Olympic strategy. Olympic strategy means what? Means how can we achieve our, our vision? Vision to be, to remain in the Olympic movement, not only to remain, but to strengthen our position in the Olympic movement. This is absolutely key. We want to remain and to strengthen uh, our position in the Olympic movement. How can we achieve that, 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 that vision? Certainly not in, in fighting to, fight, to, to defend one or another category. It's just to work constructively with the IOC to address their challenges, to propose them actively, proactively, solutions that will help them to address their challenges. This, what I would like is that we, we take that, I would say, that difficult time, that threat into uh, an opportunity. So we, we have to be creative. I'm not saying that it's uh, easy. Again, as you will probably share with me, it's a very sensitive, very sensitive subject. Uh, we have been discussing for the last three years. I know how difficult it was. Uh, thankfully, we come out with a, a, a good or the best, the best solution within the context we have. 
Now we have really to move to what, what can be the strategy for the long-term future within the Olympic movement. So this is what we want to propose to the federations. Obviously, this is not, we will not come with a final decision uh, or with a, or a, a ready solution. We don't have the solution yet, but we want to be open. And, and, and we start to hear uh, uh, some ideas and at this point, I want to really to leave the door open to uh, to the ideas, and that's why we will launch this uh, this uh, this project from now. Uh, we will take any opportunity again to be closed with close with you to give uh, to 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 give from one side to give you uh, the elements from outside and to give to pro to, to to receive from you. The feedback again when you, we when you take part in the exercise, obviously uh, uh, it, it will be much much easier at the end uh, to finalize uh, the solution. So the time frame is very tight, very tight. If you uh, remember, I mean, being ready not in December 2020, but uh, I. Uh, we will probably have to have a final solution uh, a couple of months before that the validation by the IOC, which means that we don't have that much time to 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 build that uh, that that solution, that strategy, and uh, and and to share with you. So we'll the next next uh, time uh, we will obviously org organize. Uh, national federation conferences. We, con we will continue to meet uh, with the coaches at the FISAS event during the season. So uh, we will continue to provide you uh, with, uh, with documents, with elements uh, through the different channels we have been using up to now. Uh, again, uh, um, please do take the opportunity to, to take part of this exercise. Um, I think that it was, uh, for most of you, was the case during the, the previous, uh, I would say, the, pre the, the, the previous cycle, but we need you uh, for this uh, new, uh, or for this coming cycle. We will present you at, uh, uh, on this different opportunity, obviously, the, uh, how we move ahead in, 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 this, in this approach. Uh, it's not only a question of uh, in, including, uh, I would say, only our community in this exercise, because obviously this is not only to convince, we don't have only to convince uh, people outside our community. Also, I, 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 I assume and I, I appreciate there will be uh, a debate within our community, but we will have also to, uh, to include people from outside, because again, uh, the elements to lead to the solution are also from uh, from outside. I think this is uh, what I wanted to share with you. I'm sorry I did not uh, click on the... We, I have reached now the end of, uh, of uh, what I wanted to, to, to say. Um, Three minutes to go, Matt. Uh, uh, we can, we can, we have uh, obviously a few minutes if you have uh, any questions. Very quiet. So, Matt, I give you the floor. Thank you. Okay, so that's the state of the union, the situation uh, we wanted to communicate. Thank you very much for your attention. Rosie, uh, I think it's the last session of the coaches conference. Do you want to say anything now or uh, tonight? Okay, so we have to clear the room and uh, we've, uh, we will find each other in the bar until seven o'clock when we will come back for the World Roin Awards dinner. Thank you, thank you everyone for your attention. See you later.